Welcome to Media in the Mix, the only podcast produced and hosted by the School of Communication at American University. Join us as we create a safe space to explore topics and communication at the intersection of social justice, tech, innovation, and pop culture. All right, welcome back to Media in the Mix. I'm your host, Grace Ibrahim, and today we're joined by Eddie Levy, an AU alum and an actor, singer, voiceover artist, and writer based in Los Angeles and New York with a background in musical theater and a penchant for comedy. We have to talk about that because I'm doing stand-up comedy, actually. Uh, you might have seen him for his best-known role of Anthony on the Lorne Michaels-produced sitcom AP Bio, which ran for four seasons on NBC and Peacock. So cool. And most recently, Eddie appeared on the hit HBO Max comedy series, The Other Two. We're so excited to talk about all of these things today, Eddie, and thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me, Grace. Of course. Okay, so let's start with SOC first. So can you just talk about your time at SOC? Is there a class you often think about, a professor, or you know anything you kind of reference that you learn there that you take with you into your, you know, your career, where you're at right now? Absolutely. Well, I I truly don't think I would have moved to Los Angeles if it wasn't for the entertainment com class taught by Professor Katie Borum Chateau. Love I mean, that. she is an incredible professor, as I'm sure a lot of people know. And, you know, as an actor or as someone that was an aspiring actor living in Washington, DC, you know, DC does have a really great Um, community for the arts. There's a lot of theater there. And obviously, New York is only a four to five hour bus ride away. So a lot of my friends were thinking about staying in DC or New York. But taking that entertainment comm class just completely opened my eyes and my world to Los Angeles. And, um, you know, she just sort of painted LA as the place where things were happening. And at this time, you know, I'll get into it, but at this time I wasn't sure what I wanted to pursue or what road I wanted to go down because I was a public communications major and I was doing my capstone with a uh, professor Gemma Puglisi and doing all of the stuff that SOC students do, but I did sort of have this other side to me that I wanted to explore. But yeah, that entertainment comm class completely changed the game for me. And I've actually been thinking about it a lot because Professor Katie Borm Chateau talked a lot about Norman Lear, who recently passed away. She worked with him a lot um, in her career in Los Angeles. And, you know, I feel like I really learned how he changed television and how much of a pioneer he was through her. So, um, yeah, I'm so glad I took that class. Um, And then at AU, did you do any experiential learning opportunities? I actually did. Um, I studied abroad in Prague at Charles University, which was incredible. And I felt, you know, by the time I got to my junior year, I was feeling a little burnt out. I was like really, really sort of invested in the DPA and my, um, you know, studies at SOC. And I feel like when I when I was choosing where to go abroad, I was like, I just need to get rid of, get away of everything. Like I need to get rid of SOS or not get rid of, I need to get away from everything. I need to just like do something totally different, totally unexpected, which is why I chose Prague. And that was so formative to me, not only because Prague was just incredible to live in and I met so many amazing people, but I found it so interesting that when I went to Prague, I just sort of inadvertently and so randomly became friends with all of these film students at FAMU, which is a film academy over there. And, you know, I I had never been on camera before. I had only done theater, but the experience of getting to know them, they put me in sort of their, their final film for the semester. And they actually like introduced me to a casting director. And I had my first ever television audition ever in Prague for this TV show. And it was this moment where I was like, okay, Eddie, I am halfway across the world. And I wanted to like, forget about acting and forget about all of that stuff. (laughs) And acting is finding me. Like it was so crazy. And then when I came back to AU for my senior year, um, my mentor and professor cast me as the title role in the Who's Tommy, which gave me so much confidence, I think, when it came to, oh my gosh, I can lead a show, I can be the center of a show. 
And he sort of was talking to me about what should I do after I graduate? And he was like, well, have you ever thought about LA? I feel like you'd be really great on camera. And then I took the entertainment comm class with Katie, Professor Katie Borm Chateau. So it just all kind of blended yeah. together where like the path to go to LA became clearer and clearer because of this crazy chain of events. But again, studying abroad in Prague, I just, I, I could not believe that all of these acting opportunities were finding me. And I, I still think that's a big reason why I moved out to LA after I graduated. That's amazing. Prague is one of my favorite cities. I oh, Prague. the best. The fried cheese sandwiches. Come it's, on. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> I loved it. That's awesome. That's amazing. And did you know it was going to be acting as the first step outside of, you know, graduating? Or did you have other career paths in mind? How did that kind of come together for yeah, you? Yeah, I was in straight up denial. Like, truly. <laughs> I, I changed my major a million times at AU. Like, I think I entered as a business and music major, I switched okay. to like maybe social work. And then mm -hmm. I thought I'd major in theater. And then I ended up at SOC. So I was someone that I had no idea what I wanted to do. But I yeah. knew that my passion was for the arts. But if I'm okay. being honest, like I was really scared back then. Like I was scared at the instability of the career. I, I, I don't think I really understood how this could be your job and vocation because right. it just felt like a hobby. But I feel like when I look back at my time at AU, I had the absolute best of both worlds because I got such an incredible liberal arts education, especially from SOC, where those skills are invaluable when it comes to my professional career now. Like mm -hmm. learning how to market and learning how to get a message out there is vital as an actor right. because you are the product. Right. You know, but it took me a while, I think, to have the courage to be like, wow, my heart is in acting and performing, even if it is really hard and right. really unstable. Um, but for me, it was just having the courage to get out to LA, right. having the courage to jump on that plane um, with my dream and my cardigan, as Miley right. would say. <laughs> Love it. And, How you know, could we not and, as a millennial? Know, loves, yeah. But I'm so grateful. Also, I yeah. should shout out the DPA at American University. Shout out to any DPA students listening because they have an open audition policy. So without being a major, mm -hmm. I was able to audition and be in so many of the shows. So even though That's I don't awesome. have a degree in theater, I feel like I have such an education in theater and was able to, to learn so much by being in the productions. And I had such community in the DPA right. as well. So would you say kind of, you know, being in LA and being around that environment definitely upped that motivation a little bit? rather oh, than the thought sure. prior. I moved, when I moved to LA, I moved into a house with a bunch of other AU alums. I mean, number one, mm -hmm. the AU oh, network nice. is no joke. <laughs> that's really nice, you yeah. Know, I had an incredible AU alum who was a couple years ahead of me, moved to LA after graduation. I'll never forget sitting at, at is the Chipotle in Tenley Town still there? Like right by the oh, yeah. Pittsburgh Theater. Oh we yeah. Sitting at that Chipotle in Tenley Town and she was giving me all the tea about LA, what I needed to do, how much money I needed to save up and what I really needed to figure out if I wanted yeah. to move there. And then I had my classmate Jordan was like, we should go to LA. Um, and we were able to move into this house, which was the perfect sort of transition into moving That's in LA amazing. because we had community. I'm yeah. going to say community a lot because I think community is so important. But it is. we had community and we were able to to have people a couple years older than us, like really show us around right. and really kind of tell us what we needed to do to embark on our careers. And that was, again, all because of the AU alumni network. That's amazing. We preach that so much, like our, our mentorship program, just our alumni networking events, just because this industry can be so alienating sometimes and so isolating. So you're right. Community is very important. I feel like that could just jumpstart your career just by being around other people doing the same thing possibly. But I feel, okay, so we're on the topic of acting. So I want to talk about that a little bit because yeah, there's, we actually have never talked about on the Never talked about that on the podcast. So I want to dive into little tips and tricks here if anybody's listening that are, are curious or need to know. Okay. I want to know what it's really like, the audition process. Can you talk about 
things that you have to bring with you to an audition process that people won't think about that are super important, um, just like any other job that you show up for, right? Um, and then are there any misconceptions about actors or misconceptions that you had that, you know, were were dispelled once you yes. got into the industry? Uh, so much, you know, I feel like there are so many misconceptions about acting and there are so many things that you kind of need to bring along with you to the audition process. I would say yes. on a technical standpoint, you know, auditioning has changed so much since the pandemic because a lot of the time we are auditioning from the comfort of our own bedroom because we're making right. what is called a self tape where we are recording the material and the scenes mm -hmm. on tape and sending them over to casting. So having that sort of background and technology, being able to edit your auditions, being able to light and film your auditions, again, it doesn't need to be perfect, but you do sort of need to have, you know, the foundation of being able to do that. And then when you're doing live Zoom auditions, like you need to get that Ethernet cable. You need to make sure that there are right. no, you know, there, there always is going to be a problem with technology and there's always going to be an internet problem. So you just have to make sure that you are set up for success. You know, have your sides on the side, have that pencil, mm -hmm. have that water bottle, just like make sure you're really comfortable since we're not going out into the world and auditioning, make sure that you're set up for success. But more than anything, I feel like you need to bring yourself to these auditions. I think mm -hmm. so many people are caught up in what do they want like right. what are they looking for like okay they cast this person so how can i be like them and they don't know what they want they yeah. want you to be you and mm -hmm. i feel like the second you realize that and you're able to bring your fullest self to your work and your auditions the second you're hopefully going to see results it's so right. so important and in terms of misconceptions i mean there's a lot like Acting is a lot of work. You know, one of my acting teachers out in LA says that on average, you should spend about an hour of work and prep per one page of sides. So if you get a five page audition, you know, that's five hours of prep work to read the script, learn the character, figure out the character, figure out your moment before, figure out your relationship to everybody that you're talking to. I mean, that takes a lot of time. It's not just saying the words on the page, you know? Yeah. It's figuring out what would this character wear? How would this character walk like or walk? How would this character you know, react. And there's, there's so many details, but that's one of my favorite parts because when I get to audition, I get to act and I love mm -hmm. to act. So I get so much joy out of the audition process. I think that's another maybe misconception that like actors hate auditioning. Yeah. There <laughs> are some loud people on Twitter that don't, or X, excuse mm -hmm. me. There are some loud people on the internet that don't like auditioning, yeah. but like, I'm not one of those people because again, I get to act, I get to do what I love and I love figuring out and breaking down a character and breaking down a script. It's it's yeah. one of my favorite parts about it. Um, and I do feel like another misconception of maybe not the actual process of auditioning or acting, but people sort of have this idea that like all actors are filthy rich. And I feel like with the recent strike and with the recent yeah. things that are going on, we've really sort of broken down that stigma that we're all rolling in money because we were really fighting over minimums and Yes. We really, you know, as an actor, you really have to be smart about your money because you're not mm -hmm. going to work all the time. You know, right. you might only work one or two jobs a year. You know, even when I was on my show AP Bio, we did 13 episodes a year in the height of mm -hmm. our show. That's 13 weeks of work. And you have yeah. to figure out how to make that last, how to make right. that you know, sustainable for the rest of your year. So right. I think um, people are starting to realize that, yes, there is the 1% of our industry that is quite wealthy, but the sort of me middle class working actor, like they've mm -hmm. got struggles and bills too. So I'm right. glad that people are finding awareness of that. That's great. And we're going to talk about the strike um, yes, in a bit. Sure. But I also wanted to ask you, so you mentioned earlier that it's a lot about um, acting is a lot about what you can bring and who you are. So do you have any advice on how to kind of stand out in that self-branding aspect? Oh my it really God. is a, a lot of you. Well, yeah. I mean, I would say, again, just do the work in your own life to know 
what can you do better than anybody? You know, we are often as actors sort of boil down to our type or the Mm -hmm. box that we are fit in. And I think a lot of people want to fight against that. And I do encourage being able to be like, I'm an actor and I can do a lot of things. I feel that way as an actor. But I think when you're starting out, whatever that type is, whatever that box that you feel like people are putting you in, well, you need to learn how to do that better than anybody because Mm -hmm. that's what you're going to get booked as. And that's what is hopefully going to get you noticed. And then as you start to build credits and as people start to get to know you, you're going to have sort of the sway to be like, now look what else I can do. Like, Mm -hmm. look what else. Like, I think Carrie Washington is such an incredible example. You know, she played her role in Save the Last Dance, which was, in her words, a stereotypical Black character. And then after years of work, she got to play Olivia Pope, you Mm -hmm. know, and that was her role right so sometimes it takes time and i think yes young actors really want to fight against that and be like i'm not just this i'm not just that but Mm -hmm. you have to be patient and you have to be able to to maybe find the joy or the positive side to whatever you're being tied right. cast. Because what's beautiful about acting is that prove them wrong. If you think mm-hmm. that you can do something that they don't think you can do, or you think that you aren't right for something, prove them wrong. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of power in that. Yeah. I love that, Eddie. That was great. Oh, <laughs> thank it. you. That inspired me. <laughs> oh, For good. anybody listening. I hope it inspired <laughs> you too. And it's speaking of the things you can do. So let's talk about how – Sorry, how acting kind of turned into directing and writing and how those kind of, I guess, bled into one another because this industry really does overlap in a lot of different ways. But yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that and kind of your, is there, has there been like a dive into any type of comedy or anything in that realm? Yes. Well, so many things. Well, again, it comes back to community. As I started making friends, as I started making connections in Los Angeles, what's so great about LA, and some people don't like it, but I do, is it is relatively a one industry town, similar to DC being a political mm-hmm. town. LA is the t- the city of the entertainment the industry. Entertainment, so yeah. you have so many people that have very similar goals and visions as you do, and you have a plethora of people to collaborate with. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to the writing and directing I've done, I've been able to collaborate with my friends. You know, when I was on AP Bio, my castmate, Sari and I, it was the beginning of COVID and we were sitting at home and doing nothing. And we were like, we should pitch and make a companion podcast for our show. And we were able to pitch it to NBC Universal and Peacock and get Amazing. it greenlit. And we were able to write and produce and host our podcast for the show and interview all of our co-stars and do that. And that, again, there is a certain element of our career because on the acting front, it can feel frustrating when you feel like you need to be signed off on. You have that gatekeeper that needs to say yes to you. But there are ways, you know, when Sari and I were on the show and we were like, how can we do something proactive in this community that we're a part of? We created a pitch and we got our hands dirty and we presented it to the network and they were like, this is an easy yes. And we Mm -hmm. were able to do that and we were able to learn so much and flex so many muscles doing that sort of project. And other friends, even outside of AP Bio, have been like, I'd love for you to direct my web series or direct my short film. And I've been able to get behind the camera. And then being on AP Bio, I cultivated an incredible relationship with my showrunner, Mike O'Brien. And I would sit into the writer's room and I started writing my own pilot scripts in order to get myself out there as a writer. And, you know, it's one of those things, even when you have a job it's really what you make of it. You can get an acting job and sit in your trailer and go on set and that can be it. Or you can get to know the people you're working with, go to the Mm -hmm. writer's room, shadow the director, cultivate those relationships with your co-stars because those relationships are what going to make your career everlasting. And it's so, so important. And I love creators like Issa Rae and Donald Glover and Rami Youssef that that create their own worlds, you know? Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately one of my goals as an actor, writer, performer. 
That's amazing. And I love that because there's a lot of parallels there with kind of the corporate world in terms of like, get to know the people you work with and network. And it's just a lot of the same. And although people might think, oh, it's the entertainment industry, it might be a little different. It's, it's, there's a lot of parallels. Relationships. There. So, Relationships. I love that. Yeah. And genuine. Absolutely. You know, I think yes. it can feel very like skeezy to be like, okay, I'm at this networking event and what can I get yeah. out of those th- people or what can I get out of these relationships? Just go and meet people to meet people. Make genuine yes. connections. Mm-hmm. I promise that people that you're just laughing about or, you're, again, you're bringing your fullest self and you're just mm-hmm. being you with, those are the connections that are going to stick because the connections that I have made have not been based in like, oh, I really want this job and like you can help me get this job. It's just because, oh, wow, you're a really cool person and I want to get yeah. lunch with you or I want to get a drink right. with you. It's as simple as that. And then yeah. let that relationship grow. Right. Yeah, that's super important because I feel like people need to feel like you're also investing in that relationship. Of and then course. it's two way street, genuine. Yes, totally agree. And then um, I want to talk about AP Bio a little bit more and yes. kind of just the the nitty gritty of what it's like to kind of land a job. And then can you talk about the in between of the seasons? Did you know that you were going to get renewed for another season? What is that feeling like? Mm. I mean, can you just bring any insight into that? Because I know, you know, even whether it's your first job or whether it's your 50th job and you know, you're, you're on game of Thrones. Like it's, it, <laughs> they have the same fear, right? I mean, it's, I feel like that's something that never really goes away. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Cause I feel like that's a little unique in terms of yeah. having that type of job. Yeah. Well, you know, I think AP bio is such an incredible example of like really <laughs> being open to anything. You know, I mm-hmm. went into AP bio and I, had my audition it's the shortest audition i've ever had it was literally one line the characters were sort of it's a pilot so when you're doing Mm -hmm. a pilot for television you know they're still sort of figuring everything out right like they have an idea of who the main characters were so they had a really fleshed out idea of the adult characters on that show and a couple Mm -hmm. of the students but they were just trying to sort of fill this classroom Mm -hmm with other students so they you know were like okay we need like this funny student and I came in and I did my thing but I really made the most out of that audition to be able to audition for someone like Mike O'Brien and Oz Rodriguez who come from the SNL world I did not take that opportunity lightly so Mm -hmm. I kind of went in being like okay I think I'm just doing a pilot and then that turned into four years of work and it turned into I was on a billboard in Sunset Boulevard Mm -hmm. and they completely sort of evolved and changed my character again this is a recurring theme guys because I brought myself to the part you know Mike um, encouraged or wanted my character to sort of be this nerdy like Lord of the Rings type loving student and then I remember he told me he saw me dancing to Beyonce at the rap party (laughs) of the pilot and he was like oh no that's the character of Anthony I want him to be like that and as the seasons continued I was wearing boy bye t-shirts I was like living my best life and they really you know it was such validation that I was enough you know that I was enough to be on primetime television and and be my fullest self so again you guys have to be yourself when you're out there pursuing any dream. Right. But yeah, speaking of the Mm in-between, it's really hard because we don't know. We are such at the mercy of so many other people. Mm -hmm. Um, And AP Bio, you know, having a credit like that definitely got me noticed by other people and it sort of Mm -hmm. gave me a little more recognition. So I was able to work um, in between the seasons. But again, it's about being really smart with your money, knowing, okay, this is my salary when I'm on the show. I need to make this last. What, And it's a lot of what ifs, which is a hard place for some people to be in, but okay, what if the show doesn't get picked up? What am I going to do about my lifestyle? Okay. If the show gets picked up, I'm going to be good. And like, I can maybe go on that vacation or do what I want to do. So you really kind of have to play out a lot of different scenarios, but I think more important than anything You have to find other things in your life outside of your career or outside of acting that bring you joy. I think that first season, so I I had done AP Bio, and then I was, again, fortunate enough to do another series for Netflix right after. So I was on set for about 10 months straight. 
And then I had maybe six months off between the series of the Netflix show and the next season of AP Bio. And that was a really difficult learning curve for me because I was like, what do I do with my time? You know, I was fortunate enough to quit my restaurant job and I didn't necessarily need to go to a day job every day. But I had to figure out what's giving me joy outside of my career, you know, and I started Mm -hmm. volunteering. I started spending more time with friends. I started doing things. I took classes. I took so many different types of random classes that just brought me joy and that fulfilled me. And I think, again, it took me a really long time to be like, okay, I am so much more than this career. So that's really, really important as you're navigating the in-between of your jobs. Yeah. I love that. Actually, I was just talking about that in my own personal life. Oh, (laughs) really? It's so important. Yeah. just It's not all about the work and it's just not all about like success and moving forward and growth. Like sometimes you just have to be in the moment and be present and, you know, do the things that bring you joy. And so whatever that is enjoy it. On that note, what, is there anything that brings you joy that kind of takes you away a little escapism from the crazy industry? Yes. I mean, it took a whole strike, but I finally went on vacation (laughs) this year. Um, I hadn't been on vacation in a really long time since I had moved to Los Angeles um, because it came out of fear. It came out of fear of missing out on things, missing that audition, missing that opportunity. And that's something that I really needed to work on. But I went on vacation. I went to Greece um, and I, I know it was beautiful and I felt so connected to the world. And, you know, there's this beautiful poem by Cleo Way that I'll, I'll send to you and maybe you can post with the episode, but it talks about how so often we are looking at our lives and we're thinking about the things that belong to us. Oh, that job. Oh, that opportunity. Oh, that raise. Mm -hmm. And when you take a moment and you feel connected to nature, you realize, wow, I am a part of something so much bigger than all of that. Not what belongs to me, but I belong to something. Um, And I really felt that this year. And again, it took a really low point for me to kind of rediscover that side of myself. But right. just like looking at the sunset every day, I mean, it's so simple, but it just makes me feel so grounded in myself. Yeah. And again, I, I think I said before, but volunteering, I, I've been volunteering with an organization in LA that works with kids and foster youth and oh, different types of people in the adoption constellation and working in that community has, mm-hmm. as an adoptee myself, has like really just given me so much and given me so much joy and perspective. And again, I think when I started doing things that didn't have an agenda, that didn't yeah. have, because even writing, I love writing and I, I started writing out of a place of like, how can I take more control of, of mm-hmm. my career, but it's still related to my career and entertainment, right. but really taking myself out and reading more. I mean, it's so simple, but just like reading a book that I want to read rather than a book I should read. Right. Or, you know, in LA, it's all about these are the movies you need to see or the movies you need, like you have right. to see because of the industry and be like, what do you want to take in? Yeah. It's so important. It's such a slight nuance, but it really just changes so much. And, yeah. and just spending time with friends and family and going home more. It's all of those things are just so important. Mm -hmm. So I love that. That's so wonderful. And then I'm going to do a complete 180 and bring us back to the entertainment. What was it like (laughs) seeing yourself on a billboard? Just Oh my gosh. That was, I went with one of my uh, AU alums, uh, Kate Duffy. We'll we'll have to talk about the AU community in LA because it is so strong. But Kate Duffy and my childhood friend, Chris Calandro, they drove me to Sunset Boulevard. They had passed it earlier in the week and they're like ed we have to go we have to take you to this billboard and just to see myself you know was i mean it was emotional like you Mm -hmm. know i i think i think one of the scariest things about entertainment and and the industry is that there's always more right it's like Mm -hmm. you could be doing something that even two years ago you dreamed about doing but there's always that next step and there's always that next level. And there's always that person you haven't worked with yet that you want to work with. Right. And I think a moment like that and what I try to continue to remind myself, and I think this is for anyone, don't wish your life away. Like what you're doing right now is what you dreamed of doing years ago. Yes. And, and seeing myself on that billboard just was wow, like, I can't believe how far oh I've God. come. It was it was yeah. an amazing experience. And I'm, That's awesome. I'm so happy that I got to see that with my friends. 
my oh, fellow I AU love friends. <laughs> I love and I love that you're there with AU alum. That's amazing. Yes, yes. Um, okay. I definitely we want to leave some time to talk about um the strike. Of obviously. Course. So for anyone who didn't know, it's 146 days. That's about mm. five months. And that it's actually the first industry-wide shutdown in 63 years, meaning it was actors and writers together. So mm-hmm. that's a huge deal. First off, I'm so sorry that happened. It's just unne- it's, it's unnecessary, but necessary at the same time. It's like a weird, bittersweet moment. Things have to be done sometimes in order to you know create noise, create change. So on that note, you know, what did you think of the resolve? What was it like going through that? And did you anticipate it, anticipate it, and oh, Jesus, anticipate it dragging on for so long? And then also, do you believe that there's change that can continue to happen in the yeah. industry? Yeah, you know, the strike was really a, an important moment in the history of, of my industry. And it was a lot of things. It was really, really hard. You know, I felt so much for my fellow members in SAG and in the WGA. A lot of people were really, really hurting. Mm-hmm. And being on the picket line, I heard so many stories about people that had families and kids that were worried about health insurance, that were worried about right. putting food on the table. I mean, again, it was so real because don't forget, our, our union had 160,000 mem- 160, members are in SAG. Mm-hmm. You know, out of those members at any given time, I think about 84% qualify for health insurance. That's like relative, or I'm sorry, 84% do not, do not qualify, qualify for health insurance. I apologize. No, you're With fine. 84% of our members not being able to qualify for health insurance, even when we're not on strike. Imagine what that looked like when we were. Right. And I think it was really interesting because because our industry has become so isolating because of COVID and the protocols and not auditioning in person, the picket line really gave us community. How many times have I said community on this podcast? But it's, it's a so theme important. and it's an important, yes. It's such yes. an important theme, but it truly, I got to meet so many different types of actors, you know, stunt performers, background actors, puppeteers, uh, like so many different types of people that all had different needs. Mm -hmm. And I, I was so grateful to just connect with them and, and, and hear those stories. And I'm so grateful that people were able to feel that again, after a very isolating time in our world. And when it comes to the result, I think, you know, it's a little bit of a mixed bag because again, Mm -hmm. One union is representing or representing so many different types of people. And I right. think the concerns about AI are valid. You know, as far as I understand, actors are still not defined as human in our new mm-hmm. contract that was ratified. The actor or the writers are defined as human, the directors are defined as human, actors are not, which definitely gives a lot of members pause. Um mm-hmm about why that is, you know, and I think the devil is in the details. I I think there are some big loopholes that are complicated, are complicated. And, you know, I won't get too in the weeds about that for this podcast, but more than anything, I am very, very happy that people are able to work again, that people are able to provide for their families again. I do think it was time to get people back to work. But, you know, as with everything, there are some things that may not be perfect, but only time will tell, I think, what the lasting change will be in our industry. So I'm cautiously optimistic that it will be Mm -hmm. the right thing for all of our members and that everyone will hopefully be better because of what the negotiating committee did. And they worked so hard, and I am so grateful for all of the work of the strike captain and the negotiating committee and our leadership, because it was not easy to be that yeah. strong for that long. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's interesting because I feel like it brings us full circle in the conversation back to the kind of the misconception discussion, because I, 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 my heart broke at the same time, but I loved when Billy Porter came out and was like, <sighs> you think I don't need to sell my house? Here it goes. This is this is the reality, you know, and it comes right back to that. It's like that's kind of what upset me the most is people thinking like, why does Hollywood need to go on straight? You know, it's because there's about 1.5% of what you think Hollywood is. And 
the rest are, you know, behind the scenes, behind the camera, behind the mics, behind, you know, there's so many other positions um, that happen. And, you know, yeah. So I just thought that was a really powerful moment because I was like, yeah, that's. I love that you brought up Billy Porter because he is one of my (laughs) idols. I love him so much. If you haven't read his book, everyone, Unprotected by Billy Porter. Okay. Brilliant. My plane ride read. Listen to it. Listen to it. Oh, okay. Okay. Audible. I love it. And he is just, an. I mean, that also broke my heart, but he is just an amazing testament. I mean, it took him 30 years to become the Billy Porter that we all know and love. And he's just an amazing example of like staying the course, not giving up. And again, he always says, it's easy to be who you are when who you are is popular, but as a black gay man, he was not popular for the majority of his career. And now he can be his fullest self Mm -hmm. and the world loves him. And I think it's a testament that things are changing as he says, the change has already happened, Mm -hmm. but um, he's such an inspiring person to sort of read up on if you're looking at this industry. But yes, I I loved that moment as well. And I'm I'm really glad you brought that up. (laughs) Yeah. That book is going to be my um, plain. Oh, it's amazing. Love that. Um, And then last thing, I wanted to ask this earlier. Do you need an agent or a company when you first start out as an actor? Just an important question here. I feel like people need to know. In Los Angeles, the answer is yes. Um, There are things you can audition for, maybe like short films, student films, web series, where if you sign up for Actors Access, LA Casting, Casting Frontier, you'd be able to submit for yourself on auditions. But if you want to audition for, you know, TV and film for the major Mm -hmm. studios, major networks, you do need an agent. It is a really important part, but you know, agents get paid 10% and they get paid 10% because they hypothetically do 10% of the work. Now, I think there are great agents out there that definitely do more than 10% of the work, but I say that to know that you cannot, you also can't be that reliant on your agent to get all the work done. You have to do the other 90% of the work. You have to do the work when you get those opportunities. You have to make sure, again, you are the CEO of your own business and you are the product. You have to make sure your pictures are right. You have to make sure your reels are right. You have to make sure if you want to develop a relationship with social media, you got that on lock. So there are so many other aspects of your career that you need to do the work for. And it's really, really important. But yes, you do need an agent. (laughs) Okay. Important. Okay. No, I love that. That's just important for people to know. I know we had um, an author on uh, in another episode and we were talking about the whole publishing process and he just dove so deep. You know, it's just like things that you know, might not think about um, when you first go out there, but that is so good to hear. Thank you, Eddie, so much for joining us on Media in the Mix. It's Thank you wonderful. so much for having me, Grace. This was a great convo. You are an amazing host. Thank um, you. And I hope we get to talk again sometime. I know. I hope we get to see you soon. Let us know if you're ever here. And uh, I don't yes. know if I'm coming to LA Intensive this year to film anything. But oh my if gosh, I do, I should. will let you know. Yeah, and any AU you know. students that are listening that are thinking about LA, please do not hesitate to reach out on the social media or email. And I'm happy to talk to any AU student that is trying to come out to LA and do Absolutely. their Absolutely. I was actually just going to say um, if anyone is going out to LA or has any questions for Eddie, feel, please feel free to reach out. He has a lot a lot of wisdom there to offer. Thank you so much. And if anyone wants to donate to the School of Communication, go to giving.american.edu and I will see you on the next episode. 